Oh, hi, Vincent Fecto. Uh, hi, Derek McCormick. <laughs> How are, How are you? you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, it's minus 700 degrees here. <laughs> Should we tell people or let people know that we um, are very good friends and we talk all the time? We do. So, <laughs> and for long periods of time about a lot of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, welcome to a lot usually of nothing. Not, usually not over Zoom. We usually do it. I, at least I know I'm not looking at a video while I'm talking to you. Um, we tried Zoom. I remember we tried Zoom or FaceTime once, and we were both deeply unhappy with it. Yeah, with looking at the at beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, maybe, or it, it was before that. I quite like looking at you, but I, even now I'm like I'm confronted with this dome of mine. It's well, the it's yeah. We don't need to get into the problems of <laughs> video conferencing, but yes, it's great to see you, Derek. It's well, been happy. so long. I know it's been days. Yeah. We have a lot to catch up on. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to see your studio and you still got sunlight streaming in. Uh, yeah, it's, what is it, four or something, yeah. So. And works in progress. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought you were gonna do a green screen with some kind of- um, Oh, I was gonna- <laughs> Maybe the Simpsons or some yeah, maybe Saga. Maybe in our second hour, I'll come back for, with uh... I'd love it, special effects. Yeah. And, and you were sitting before green screen, right? That's not, that's not <laughs> real. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll know it's my apartment because I'm expecting like big black flies to fly around me at any point. I have, I know it's winter in Canada, but I have these black flies everywhere in my apartment. I think I might be hatching them. Some part of me has died and I don't know it. Um, <laughs> you, you always describe your apartment in the, in the worst terms. And I I've never been to your apartment, but I am, it will be part of my Toronto. Uh, my, I've never been to Toronto. And, but when, when I finally make it to Toronto, that will be my pilgrimage to see your apartment. It'll be the final stop. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't speak ill of my apartment. I have a great apartment and I have amazing landlords and I live in a beautiful old house, but I'm a slob. I mean, I, I like there's a layer of dust, like a piece of felt on everything in this apartment. And I sort of like this background because I feel dust works with it. It looks old, <laughs> it looks raggedy. Oh, I could even maybe line this one up so it looks like I have the fake fur. Yes. <laughs> um, Speaking of which, we were, when we were originally talking about doing this conversation, we came up with the idea that we would do a, sh a show and tell as a way of talking about, I don't know, having, making it more fun for ourselves. So, um, do you want to start or do I? I would love you to start. I, I'm, I, I, I pulled a bunch of things that um, are uh, really about like the history of our friendship as well as being beautiful oh. things. Oh, so, wow. Well, th that's so... Like, <laughs> I, think, I don't have a theme. I was just going through. And I guess I'm just sentimental, Vincent, <laughs> yes, about you. Yes. I guess I just value what we have. Well, I do too, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. That is so... <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go for it now that now that you've set me up for <laughs> I'm gonna go first. Yes. Okay, so this um, This is a two part Because um, I'm gonna throw you a curveball right now. So okay. now that you <laughs> So this is the first part of my Oh So is that Santa <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Scott found this on the sidewalk in front of our house the other day when it was raining. And it must have been a kid's painting of Santa that all the clothes mel <laughs> melted off. And I just think it's the best thing ever. It's now up on my, uh, I guess it's my mood board. <laughs> it's <laughs> so really beautiful. It got, uh, it's got Paul McCarthy eyes. Yeah. And it got, um, it's kind of sexy now, like yeah. strippery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it looks like. 
yeah, I can't tell quite what's going on with the with the red, but it looks like it just all dissolved into the paper. And there's still some, is that white paint, white on the beard? Yeah. And I guess that's supposed to be a hat, but it looks like his head, his scalp. Yeah. That's yeah. a really, it's a really beautiful work. <laughs> it's good. And so that, that leads me to my second, um, the two-parter of it, which is this. Oh! <laughs> which, oh. which, what? So, <laughs> so this is uh, Derek's new book um, that just coincidentally, I got in the mail this week. But it is really a coincidence because Derek did not send it to me. I ordered it from the publisher and it just happened to arrive this week. <laughs> That's really nice. And, um, and I've read it what? already and it's amazing. And I rec highly recommend it. Um, and I have lots of questions. I have lots of uh, little things in here to, but one of the things, because this reminded me of the, the little <laughs> mini chapter on pink Oh yeah, yeah. And about all the film stock turning pink. Yes. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because I really... Oh, okay. First of all, I'm touched. And second of all, I'm excited. I haven't seen the finished product. Oh, you haven't? No, so that I have no, a, mo a mock-up that looks like it, but I hadn't, I'm so happy that it's arriving in- It's in beautiful. Film. It's. It's beautifully, the, the uh, typeface and the way it's set is perfect, is really great. I hope you skip the boring parts. <laughs> no, there are no boring parts. Well, thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, that is a curveball, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to, to, to talk about it. So there, uh, Vincent mentioned a chapter of the, uh, the book is like, the book is essays and, and reviews that I've written over the last 20 years. Um, there's a lot about my writing, but I think the majority are about fashion because I used to be a fashion columnist for a newspaper here, which is hard to believe when you see me. Um, but it's also hard to believe that they were published in a mainstream newspaper when you read the pieces. Yeah, in a I mean, that's, that's really shocking. Right-wing newspaper. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a surprise and it's a surprise it was, it was fun doing it. Uh, I got to talk to a lot of people and occasionally travel on junkets and things. Um, and, but the piece you're talking about, I wrote uh, uh, just out of interest about Vera West, who was a um, costume designer for Universal in the golden age of horror. Um, uh, she made uh, mostly women's dresses, but for big movies, the Wolfman and all the Wolfman sequels and uh, uh, the mummy. Um, it's possible she worked on the Bride of Frankenstein's costume. No one seems to know, because as I say in the essay, no sketches survive and uh, no artifacts from that shoot, uh, clothing wise survive. Um, but I also talk about, I also talk about in that, um, Kenneth Anger and uh, underground films and uh, how a lot of the stock, um, from the age from the age of Technicolor is uh, well, it's it's not only super flammable and fragile, but it's turning pink. So that apparently, when you watch certain prints of this, uh, the world itself is pink. The sun is pink. The grass is pink. Um, and uh, I have never seen that though. I just heard um, uh, my friend William Jones uh, told me about. Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of it, Decasia? Anyway, it's a compilation of degraded film stock oh. uh, that an, an artist put together, which I, I would love to see. Um, Just like little clips, like a collage. Yeah, I guess so. What was, you're right, what was, uh, what was projectable and transferable? Because I guess this stuff is fragile or maybe it's already been transferred to VHS in its terrible state. Hmm. But I guess I love the thought of you know, the proclamation of a pink world, of a, of a, you know, it's not only that the sun's pink, but that the sun's a fag. <laughs> and um, that, you know, that the decay process was actually maybe an important part of uh, film's legacy, 
as a faggoty medium or as a medium of monsters that maybe that the pinkening of it uh, is what had to happen or what has to happen or it was preordained to happen that maybe that it's a world where um, the film itself turns into something as brittle and beautiful as a sequin. There's a lot of sequins in the book, as you know. I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about read, I mean, I've read some of your pieces that you wrote for the, um, it's the post, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and you're so clear about these facts. Like there's, it's really, you really love a fact, you know? I do. And I love that about that. It's like, um, uh, I kept on imagining film strips from when I was a child um, in elementary school and how there would be the, you know, each image would have a fact underneath it and then it would, you hear the bing and then you'd switch the next thing. And I kept on hearing this dinging sound in my head as I was reading some of your pieces because it's like, here's a fact and then here's a fact and here's a fact. And then of course there was always this like, here's a fact and a really weird sentence after it. That's right. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm, I love, you know, I love, I love a declarative sentences. I, first of all, I love facts and I collected a lot of facts for years as they read. I put them all in a file along with similes I thought up and lines I wanted to put in books. So when I go back to find the sources for things, I can't distinguish between things I made up and things that I read. <laughs> And to me, that's ideal, you know, because I feel I feel part of what I have to do in writing is declare shit I made up as well. Uh, it, it's all it's all become one in my mind, um, and I do I do like those. But there is something special when I remember what a fact is. Like I remember in one of my novels, something about you know the best gorilla suits are made in Hungary or something mm -hmm. like that, or blood looks. Uh, you know, brown or red looks brown and black and white. Or so I forget those lines, but I, those are things I clipped out of books. And uh, yeah, to me, they're like spangles on a dress, mm -hmm. you know, or bugle beads or something. They're um, they're there to stop you and dazzle you. Um, the weird thing putting out a book of nonfiction is that I'm not sure it's all true. <laughs> I would, I would do. I mean, was it? There must have been some amount of fact checking going on at the post, right? No, <laughs> no, there is no fact checking. I, I, I wonder about your audience also. Like that's one of the things that I feel like I had to keep on reminding myself was that these essays were uh, usually read as someone was reading the newspaper, right? So it wasn't as if they were one after another. So you here you kind of get your your style and your tone is so specifically you, but in the context of a newspaper, to come across one of these pieces was must have been so shocking and strange. And I think about like those comic strips, like uh, Zippy, you know, those comic strips that you would see as a child, or I would see as a child, and think, why is this in the pa who <laughs> who is who's interested in this thing, you know, like, and and then, but of course, there's always the hardcore fans who think like this guy is like uh speaking to me from you know some amazing uh you know this is like alien communication of uh, of the highest sort and i was wondering if you had were there people that contacted you that were like i don't know what this is but this is amazing because it never. must have sounded so <laughs> never <laughs> that's not true that is not true I think my editor, Natalie Atkinson, read them. She's a great editor and she gave me a lot of leeway, but I don't think anyone ever read them. I mean, oh, that's not true. I think it was a paper that was basically left outside of motel and hotel rooms across Canada every morning and people would whisk it in and look at the headline, maybe the stocks. I don't know. But someone read them and someone was like, what the hell is going on here? Well, it would amaze me because I think part of the writing is like the initial effect is to dissuade those people from reading. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing welcoming about it. There's nothing familiar. And I'm, I go into them talking about shit no one cares about, maybe except me. Um, but I think and, in that context, it was so strange. It's almost like a, a conceptual art project or something that you had engaged in. Like, I'm gonna do this like crazy thing and put these things. They're like little bombs in. I'm really lucky 
you know, I'm lucky that they always said, write your style, right? Uh, that I could write my style. I mean, th there were conventions you had to adhere to. If I met, if I interviewed someone, I had to represent them properly. And <laughs> well, <laughs> properly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read those never, interviews. I never recorded interviews. I would just sit there with a notepad, like making lines and my pen, and they would think I was writing 100 words a minute. Um, Your interview with Nicola Guisquier is really good. Oh, thank you. I I was I loved that. I I interviewed him at the. Um, uh, oh shit! It's a it's a big fancy hotel, the Carlton or something in New York, mm -hmm. and you you know you. We would sit in a waiting room. First of all, I'm always the worst dressed person in the press room waiting. And I have toothpaste on my shirt and I, you know, very little bowel control. And um, and then you're ushered up. And I remember that he had sort of a bouncer who I found it was the guy that had been the bouncer at all of Jean-Paul Gauthier's early shows, like a, a renowned, uh, tough, a tough kind of faggot to get past. Like he had no bullshit fag. Uh, but Nicola was so cute. I mean, that's my first thing is he's so, he was so yummy. And um, I remember that one really well because I felt, um, there were times, there were times when I was doing it when I could pinch myself because I really felt like I was Katie Keene from the comics or something like I was in the big city and I was talking to big designers, me a little farm boy. Um, I remember after, I got a package delivered here from him, a, a necklace. So they had bought like the same gift for everyone that interviewed him and they didn't expect a guy, I guess, or they knew that I would wear the necklace. <laughs> um, but that was one of the few times I got like something free out of it. So I was really delighted. Um, and that was before you wrote, it wasn't like they gave you that after they read you what you wrote. No, no, they didn't. I mean, you know, it's weird with Canada and fashion that that it's not a huge market. There's some markets here, but so these people would do junkets and talk to 50 American and French and English journalists, and there'd be one person allowed from Canada. And um, uh, and sometimes that was me. Um, and, and, you know, I got gigs that I liked because I was, a you know, Margiela freak, so I got to go to the H&M launch and... Uh, the other rule was I, you know, I met a lot of people that I didn't like or I thought were terribly stupid. And I did, I try, I tried to, you can't just say that. I mean, as much as I love declaring facts, you can't say X is stupid. Um, but some of them like that Killian Hennessy, I wrote about his perfume house, this mm -hmm. rich kid who started a perfume house. And I, I remember he was so proud that he got a PhD in Baudelaire from the Sorbonne. And I asked him what Baudelaire's favorite scent was. And he said, oh, I don't know. And I thought that's, <laughs> how is that possible that you've devoted your life to this person yeah. now having said that i can't remember what it was <laughs> um but thank you for saying that because i know when we talk we often we used to we, we we you and i follow fashion is one of the things that we do as a sport together yes also you would not know that from by the way i dress either <laughs> but yes we are both really interested yeah we do follow it like we like sports we do like we know, we, we know we, who's designing where and and yeah. we and we call each other when the shows are on and complain about everything even though i will never buy any of it um uh or, and definitely not wear any of it so i tried to make you buy some of it once yes <laughs> in, in uh, chicago yeah we went to barney's and you were having you looked amazing in it yeah I don't even remember that, but you, I know you mentioned this the other day. Well, like I'm saying, Vincent, you're a famous artist. You're tall, you're young, you're handsome. You should buy this. I mean, but I do that when I go shop. I love shopping with people and I love when they spend a ton of money and go through some <laughs> kind of a grief about it, a remorse yeah. relation. Yes, yeah. Because uh, I feel it too. And then I yeah. take an Ambien and go to bed and I don't have that. <laughs> Although the Ambien is a problem. I remember when I started on Ambien, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I one day I had like a, a blue come de garçon suit delivered to my house. <laughs> no, you didn't tell me that. And was it the I right size? It was beautiful. It was the right size, and it was from Essence. And I remember, I remembered sort of my thought process, which was like, I'm a grown man. I have to have a navy suit. You know, maybe that's true in some world, 
but it's not true in mine. Fortunately, in those days, you could return everything, <laughs> everything. And you had to return a ton of shit before you got on their like list. Uh, do you think they have a list for people who return too much stuff? I oh, think yeah. they have a list that, you know. And then what happens? And then they have to make an alternate identity, I guess. I mean, I don't know how you stop those people. Yeah, because you clearly, if you're determined, you you're don't determined. Want um, I have a good friend who returns everything she buys. Is it expensive stuff for just- No, no, it? it's not. I mean, she's just as always. When we were, um, we spent one summer living in uh, Middletown together and she bought, like, she's like, oh, I can't bear the summer in Middletown without, a TV, um, you know, a new air conditioner. She bought all these like ex appliances. And then two months later, she just returned them all after the summer. <laughs> I was shocked too. I, I, I couldn't do that. I'm sort of too Sunday schoolish to do that. Yeah, me too. I, I would be more sort of mortified. I also work in retail. I've worked in retail my whole life. So, you know, I, I see people trying to pull those tricks. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. this was a major department store. This was not a... I guess you could do that, corporate. right? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm sure, whatever. I'm sure it leads to bad things, but. I think Nordstrom's has a policy. They'll take anything, right? I yeah. think so. used to have that policy. Okay, I'm going to, um, speaking of fashion, I'm going to oh, give God. you a show and tell. So pretty soon after we met, you sent me two of these, which are plastic oh, walnuts. Oh my God. Yeah, plastic walnuts. Why plastic walnuts, Vincent? I don't know. I mean, I know, I know they they were from a, a store here. Uh, I think, I mean, it was one. I was working at the florist at the time, and I think they were around the shop for something. I think they were like a for what? <laughs> I don't know. They were like a a centerpiece of someone's or or what did you put on someone's plate? like a little amusement or something. Like a wrink big wrinkled nut. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there was ribbon involved in- This was some kind of San Francisco flower shop, yes, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't a gay party either, I'm sure. Well, it was after these arrived. <laughs> yes. um, I will say like- you It's amazing. I forgot about those things. He, uh, now I I'm he, regretting sending it to you now. Yeah. <laughs> I could just write your address on it and ship yeah. it back. Yeah. Um, you've used nuts in your work, have you not? Yes. <laughs> not recently. I love nuts. All nuts. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm opening the nut. And what you sent me were... I'm dying Dude. to know because you know I have no memory about any of them. They were prototypes for brooches. Oh. Hmm. So this is one brooch. What is that? It's oh. Like a, it's like a cardboard shape with a raffia and some cutout images in the, or actually painted uh, kind of basket weave in the back. And then the pin is here. Oh. And then there was this one, which is a, a goose. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best into. oh my i can't believe you're not wearing that right now i'm gonna put it on right now that is okay. such a <laughs> so this leads me to a bunch of questions i'm sorry but that is the best brooch ever here we go all due respect to judy blame who you've named your book after i think this <laughs> well oh my gosh I'm just gonna have to pretend it's there because I'm already oh, a little too tipsy to do it. It looks one. amazing. I mean, it looks like your background too. It's very... Uh, oh, it does uh, look like a knockdown doll. Kind of. <laughs> um, so I guess my, I, have a number, I have a number of questions for you. One, you think you can just put a pin on something and call it jewelry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, of course, you know that. On anything? Yes. Um, was this possibly from a thrift store? Uh, oh, most definitely. You were you were a thrifter before the pandemic. I don't know what thrifting is. Hap well, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, there is a there is this amazing thrift store here in San Francisco called Community Thrift, which is uh, it's like a nonprofit thrift store, and you can uh, everything's they'll they'll sell anything. 
um, like literally you bring them a, they'll just put a price tag on it and put it on the shelves and it's all price to move. Like they really move through things very quickly. And so I love going there because there's just shelves and shelves. They have shelves of like whatnots. I don't know what, it's just like stuff. Um, and most of the stuff that, that I have is from there. I mean, most of this, like most of the other stuff that I have assembled for our show and tell is from there. <laughs> well, how much do you ever leave empty handed? Uh, probably not. No. And where does it all go? Is it uh, sorted and embedded? I have, I have bins of stuff. It's not sorted, but I have bins of stuff. I mean, maybe I leave empty handed once in a while, but rarely. Rarely. Yeah, I, I would leave empty handed only if I just was like getting, I don't know, I needed to go somewhere or I just didn't have time or there are too many people. There are people, some weirdo crowding me in my, you know, I like my time to look at things. And if people are like, you right. know, hovering or right. getting aggressive, I would, I might leave. So do you have any memory? Are these like autumn, winter, or spring, summer collections? I have no, I know. I think there are any season. I think, you, I mean, it looks fantastic on you right now. I mean, I have to say the 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 one that I did the least amount of work to is definitely the highlight. That's the keeper. <laughs> if you keep anything I've ever sent you, that's the one you should keep because that is amazing looking. I keep everything you send. <laughs> and um, vice versa, I guess. And these are meaningful because I think very early on in our friendship, we talked about, I I said, you have, you should make jewelry because I really wanted to make jewelry. Yes. What you do? Saying, well, I sort of do. I do secretly mm -hmm. i mean uh, oh sorry now the cat's out of the bag <laughs> anyway my uh, yes now now Your instagram account is um i've never posted <laughs> anything i've made i started making jewelry actually when i the last time i saw you which was before the pandemic in san francisco and i had bought a ton of stuff on ebay and I said, can I send you something I bought on eBay? And then you got 47 boxes and it filled your car and you picked me up and you said, I have a lot of shit. And uh, it was all stuff that I was going to use to make jewelry, which I've slowly been doing over the pandemic. But, you know, I'm loath to say, I'm loath to think that I have any visual talent because I don't think I do. And I'm, I'm talking to you, who has loads of visual talent. Look, look what you have on your chest, Derek um <laughs> that's all come on now. it's amazing but i i will say that Ju like Ju i i, I sort of mentioned this because the book is my book is about judy blaine and there's a lot of there's stuff about jewelry in there and but there wasn't there wasn't we have over the years talked about what makes good jewelry i i know that like we were both impressed with margella's jewelry you know ice that's dyed a certain color that drips and we both get a kick out of that yeah um, I, I mean we both get a kick out of I mean, you, you write about punk in your book. And I think we're both, uh, uh, we both were are a little young for punk, but also uh, uh, too, too scared and too nerdy and too, um, to actually participate. But, but it's a, a way of seeing the world that, really resonated for I think for both of us as children is that right yeah I, yes yeah. yeah completely um I think you're right about the you know I tried I, I remember trying to look like I had a safety pin through my cheek uh but I never I could never put a look together I couldn't put a punk look together I couldn't put a new romantic look together no matter what I did I had bad glasses and like that skin colored clearasil that wasn't actually my skin color all over. I still do, there's no change. Um, but yeah, I would say punk. I, I, and I think that's the right word for Judy Blame too because I was thinking, I don't love that word deconstruction but I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I fell into that and liked it after punk but I think punk was it. I mean, I think, you know, when I, when I read about punks in London they would, you know, go to a concert and stick a concert ticket on their shirt or it was it wasn't just badges i mean it was literally anything mm. that could put have a pin through it became jewelry mm. and um and obviously you learned from that and maybe you learned some sculpture techniques from that as i've never thought about punk and your sculptures but um obviously mm. there's some weird shit on your art 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a general uh, kind of uh, suspicion of authority or desire to um, mess with rules. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think part of it is growing up gay, you know, I mean, or a large yeah. part of it is growing up gay and feeling like you're never going to make it in the regular world. So you might as well, you know, poke at it or tear it at it or yeah, middle finger or whatever, like you're, you and we came nothing to lose at a certain point. Yeah, and we came of age at a point when it was synonymous, a gay and punk or new wave was synonymous anyway. Mm -hmm. Those clubs were havens. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the first time I saw, as a teenager, we, we would change our, our um, driver's license so that we could get into the 18 and over clubs. And it was the first time I saw um, two men dancing together. You know, I mean, it's a, it was a different time. I mean, we're, here we are, we sound like such old gays, but it was a different time. And you never saw like depictions of gay people in, you know, for, I grew up on suburban Long Island. I mean, there was nothing. Available. What was your reaction to seeing two men dancing? Oh, I was so excited. Yeah? Yeah. Because the thought repulses me. <laughs> it does not. Uh, yeah, no, no, it was, yeah, it was so exciting. Like that, oh, there is this, there is this place where, and they're not being yelled at or made fun of or. Um, yeah. I mean, I will say for me, punk was a look. I mean, I, I loved, people would say, oh, punk's nothing but fashion, but that's what I loved about it. And in particular, Vivian Westwood. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the music for you? Did, was the music any, did the music carry you somewhere or was it more about being? Yeah, I was more into like gothy music, like more Susie and the Banshees than like hardcore punk stuff. Um, but I worked in, and I was very, you know, I went to a Catholic school and I went, I, you know, I had dress code and I was shy. I didn't like being looked at in that way, but I had friends who were, I worked at a, uh, for, for a while, I worked at a record store in the mall and uh, I had friends who were uh, punk, like really punky. Um, and I was thrilled by them I mean I felt like the biggest square next to them but they kind of allowed me to tag along once in a while and um, we'd go to shows and you know but you would so name like a, what's a formative show you would have gone to at that period uh I saw the Ramones um I guess I don't know how punk punk they are but they were uh and I mean on Long Island which was very especially the part of Long Island I grew up in it was all heavy metal like um and punk punk was queer and uh the Ramones were considered punk uh to these heavy metal people so and this the Ramones concert was in um in this in this heavy metal club in some strip mall on Long Island and uh yeah it was like chaos complete chaos and it was like there were fights breaking out and it was just like madness and you know I was like I drove my mother's car there. And of course there was this big fight spilled out into the parking lot and my the side window of my mother's car got smashed. Oh, <laughs> so it was winter time too. I had to drive home with no window. <laughs> oh shit. My poor mother was like, oh, <laughs> it was not good. Was she, was she furious? Did she believe yes. your story that you had been an innocent? Yeah, she, I mean, she, I mean, look at me. I was not so. I was not. <laughs> I was not doing bad things. You know, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But and she knew that I liked to be in the wrong places. But you know, I remember my my dear beloved sister Melissa. She took me out for a night in Toronto in high school, and I was wearing like like a fake Montana coat and a huge rhinestone brooch and um, Ponzi Patrick Cox shoes. And I remember we drove back to Peterborough, which is the small town where I grew up and uh, the car hit ice and, and went into a field oh. at like four in the morning. 
And I remember her saying, we have to walk to a farmhouse. And I was basically in heels <laughs> and like a silk chemise. I was a new way. I was a new romantic walking the farm fields of Ontario. <laughs> you know, we finally found a farmhouse where the guy was up because he was going to a shift at General Motors. And um, uh, I'm trying to think of formative shows. I mean, did he take pity on you? He did. I mean, they were good Christian people. They, you know, they love my sister and they waited and my, you know, like my dad picked us, me up and, and my dad, you know, he is sainted. He was a saint. He never, they never batted an eyelash at that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I, you did remind me though, that of the shows I went to, the shows were really important. It, the build up to them was super important and buying a t-shirt was important. The shows themselves were less important. So what was a formative show for you? Well, I write about it in the book. You know, when I was 10 or 11, I saw Rough Trade, this Canadian mm -hmm. band that was like the general idea house band. And they were really openly gay and pervy. And I went to see them at a Catholic high school in Peterborough. And this singer, Carol Pope, masturbated on stage. Um, that, you know, that was titillating me. I was more like, where'd she get her clothes? That was... I talk huh. about that in the book, like, how does one enter this world? How does one penetrate this gay world? But you mentioned Susie, and I remember seeing Susie when I was, uh, I don't know how old I was, but uh, um, I saw Susie a couple of times, but the one show I really remember is that people had waited for hours and hours and they, you know, they ran to the front of the stage and they were up front and she just walked along the edge of the stage and kicked them all in the head one by one as she walked <laughs> by. And uh, I just, I mean, can you think of anything more endearing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially when you're 16 or 15 or something, you just think, oh my God. Well, yeah, and also I thought these should be my people, but I was still too snotty. You know, I still felt mm -hmm. I was better and more interesting than them. So I loved her kicking them in the head. Like e even among the snotty artsy people, I thought that I was superior <laughs> and I loved that she you clearly are? thought she was. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to show you something else because it's sort of related to what I showed you before. So this is on, this is, this is a thing I made you that I never sent you. Oh. But for a while, I don't know if you remember, we had like, we were going to just start a novelty gag company together. Oh yeah, that sounds right. Called, um... <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh, doodad and sons. Oh yeah, two dads and sons. And then the motto was gay gags to gag gays. <laughs> and what it involved mostly was I would buy vintage. I think two dads was my contribution. <laughs> the, the second part was definitely your contribution. I love a doodad. Oh, and we would, I would buy novelty gay, uh, gags, vintage ones and send them to you. And so if it said, you know, vintage, um, uh, vintage fake um, fly or vintage hand buzzer, you would write gay on all of them. <laughs> and I made you this, which is in fact a brooch. Oh. So it's a squirting flower and I made it so it has two squeezable oh my God. nuts at the bottom. So you could wear it with- I can't believe you didn't send that to me. I'm gonna send it to you now. My, you know, my birthday's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> five months <laughs> yeah. well i mean i can wait but i just want you to talk <laughs> that's about, amazing i mean have you ever met an artist as great maybe as me no, <laughs> no that's so good isn't that a whole career yes seriously that is fantastic i guess so my question is what am i doing with my life <laughs> i don't know if I think you, you're done. I think you're done, <laughs> especially now that this is going to be public. You know, I guess I, my you're going to have to change your email address for sure. What should I do with my life? That's my next question. To <laughs> I, know. I don't know, but I, speaking of things that people have sent each other, there are so that now that makes clear why I have a box of stuff that you've sent me over the years. And by box, I mean a big plastic thing. And I was going through it and there were a few things that I'm like, I don't even know what this is or why. Now I'm gonna, 
show you something and you tell me if you know, remember it and if you know what it is. Oh, I do know what it is. And, okay. and actually I should, so everyone can see there's three of them in the box. Are those golf tees inside? <laughs> yes. So what those are, are mink stoles for golf tees. Uh-huh. <laughs> I still don't get it though. I still don't get it. So I, first of all, so glamorous. But this was like, so we should clarify, you did not make these, you bought these. Oh yeah, I could never come up with anything. <laughs> yeah. But then the question is, why would anyone make these? Well, first of all, mink is glamorous and everyone wants to mink. Yes. And second of all, at the height of novelty gags, actually I shouldn't say the height because I don't, you know, the height might have been. <laughs> There's no height. Soon. It's still going. Let's be honest. It never ended here. Uh, I remember those were like a gift for the man who has everything. Hmm. So you would say, you know, the box would say a gift for the man who knows everything. You'd open up and there'd be golf tees. There would be mink. I mean, I'm not explaining anything. I can't explain why such a thing was made. Well, this is, this is the other one that you sent me. It says for the well-dressed person. Yeah. What do you think's in it? Uh, like, is it, I have, I don't know. I, don't, I was gonna say- Related. A, a Peter warmer, but I don't know if it's too small. Not for me, maybe. <laughs> what is it? It's a piece of mink again? <laughs> yes, it's a genuine mink belly button warmer. Perfume. Oh my God, I'm too good to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a sign, Vincent, of how much I love you. I know. That I gave you these things. And it's a sign how much I love you that I've worn it every day since. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when my we belly were... button has never been warmer. Yeah. I remember at Barney's, I saw your belly button and that was not in it. I don't know where it was <laughs> that day. I don't know how you left home without it. No. Where's Scott? I want to find out the truth about this. Is Scott into that? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, because you said I love doodads. And I love doodads, and those are doodads. Yeah. Um, I guess art is a bunch of doodads. Is your art a doodad? Do you make I doodads? Hope. I hope. If, you if I can make someone think, have that the experience of looking at one of these things <laughs> with my sculptures, that'd be amazing, don't you think? I think it's amazing. I don't know if the world thinks it's amazing. I know that doesn't matter to us that much. No. Um, I thought maybe they were, no, they're not. They're glued on, they're permanent, the main. You work on your pieces a long time. So this doodadism is not easy. Uh, takes, maybe takes, for me it isn't, no. It takes a long time to make a doodad. <laughs> yes. I mean, you put hours and hours, I said, why in my writing? I mean, yeah. in, in really my writing, you know, I've said this before, but really my dream is to make a section of my writing a brooch. It's really just brooches pinned on paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that comes through, especially in this book. I think it really feels like, and I was noticing that you have the best endings, like that oh. you have this way they make every time, and I'm I'm curious. That was actually a, a something I was thinking about asking you is like how. What do you think about the end, and how do you? Um, do you start with the ending and then move backwards, or are you sort of uh, at, at some point during the thing you're like, oh, here's the end because they they're so they stop so abruptly and in such a funny way. Um, I'm really curious about it because it really is such a specific thing that you do. I actually like put a few down that I thought were amazing. There's one that I, this is my, 
Oh, this means that fashion, like fagginess, is forever. Italics are mine. The last line is italics are mine. What a great ending, because fashion, like fagginess, is forever, is in italics. That's amazing. Um, I can't really take all the credit. I mean, I, I think, it, you know, those essays were written in a way to be service journalism, though they often failed. They were supposed to engage a general reader and tell them something. And I, I think one of the rules is you end strong. But I think maybe <laughs> my idea of ending strong is different than other people. I'm always so relieved to be done. I mean, I hope that those last <laughs> lines show some degree of how relieved I am. Yeah. To be done with the shit of writing. Yeah. Because it's really hard and it's really time consuming. And as I get older, I have less concentration and less energy. But it does it also then become the thing that you amuse yourself with? Oh, like, yeah. Because I, I mean, I think for me, like there's always something, there always has to be something that makes me laugh about my sculptures. And it might not be clear to, or obvious to other people, but there's always gotta be something where I think, oh, that is so awful and funny. <laughs> you know, it's like that brooch, you know, or something like that. It always has to have that for me. And I wonder if that's like the punk thing or this like, or. Um... Yeah, me, I, I mean, I love that you say that because I, I, I have this experience of seeing your art and also seeing you in life. I remember we went to the, what is that mystery house called? The... Oh, geez, the. Uh, um... Okay, it's in, in, near, in California. It's like the name of a guy. No, not the Remington. I forget what it's called. No, it's it's the um, oh god. Oh, here is Vincent and I. <laughs> this is our conversation. <laughs> no, like right? this is the, Google. This is, <laughs> this is yeah. It's the Winchester Mystery House. Yes, yes. But we barely went. We went in it, but you were like, we have to the gift shop. The gift shop. I just wanted to get to the gift shop, and then we yeah. sat and had a drink at the edge of the gift shop in what looked like an. <laughs> An 80, it hadn't been updated since the 80s and it was this terrible salmon in green color. Mm -hmm. and I remember of all the things we'd seen that day, you were mesmerized. You were like, yep. this is so beautiful. Yeah. And it was such a, a moment for me because I realized, well, I would never have noticed it, first of all, because I don't have a visual sense. And two, it was so ugly and you were so in love with it and you made, and, and then I realized how you do the colors in your sculpture. I yeah. mean, you are challenging yourself with ugliness. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess my question, it's just a small question, but would you say it's like every sculpture contains that element that makes you laugh? Is it every, is it every way? In some way, in some way, there's something that's like, I mean, don't you think that like making something, writing is always trying to find uh, the thing that surprises you, right? I think, and, and then if you can surprise yourself, that means that you're seeing something about yourself or experiencing something about yourself that you didn't know before. You know, I mean, it's all, all of this is happening in our heads, right? There's no reality, basically. So we're all constructing this, and especially in our studios or in our offices or workplaces, it's all just a construction. So when something happens in that space that, that you, you know, and think, oh God, that's crazy. You're I, like learning something. There's something that's like, oh, you're, you're outside of yourself. Or I think it's, that's like the whole point of any of this. Like for me, it's, is to find that place where um, I'm surprised. I guess I have a couple of things to say. One is that I do experience that with your work, uh, for sure. Um, I do laugh. I mean, I've chuckled, for sure. I'm not lolling, but I'm chuckling uh, at your work often. And, um, and two, I think we both, what we talk about a lot is how hard it is to surprise yourself, yeah. how difficult it is. And, I guess the thing with me, and maybe you too, is that when I have surprised myself, I'm, su 
What surprised me is that it's often the same thing over and over a version, but I have to earn it every time. Mm -hmm. I have to work really, really hard to discover the simplest thing. So I guess in my case, it's like, I, I've only ever once talked to a writing class and I, you know, I had very few pieces of advice. I'm not, I never took writing courses. I have never went to university. I, I would never want anyone to have to, I don't want anyone to write like I do. I don't know why I wouldn't wish that on anyone. But one was you've already always written the ending. The ending's always, always there. You just have to rip something away. And what do you mean? Wait, what, what do you mean by that? I mean that if you're wondering where to end something, it means you've already ended it. You need to cut the last six lines. Oh, interesting. That you always go on too long and that there's always something buried there. There's, I mean, you mentioned my endings, but there's, it's always already there. And maybe you've went on to explain it or to, you know, to talk about the meaning of something or to bring something else in, but it's probably already there. So is that the secret to these pieces is that you at some point just cut away and then you're like, okay, there we go. Well, I, I think so. You I think that's like the, the, the backspace button until you got to a certain point and you're like, okay, well, that's I think, better. I think in the earliest cases, it's like, it's already there. And I think that what I've learned as a writer over the years is that when I write a last line, it sometimes seems like it should open onto another paragraph. I've sort of come to learn that the jolt of the last line, that I don't have to keep writing. Mm -hmm. That if the jolt is strong enough, I can stay. But my only other advice was like, there's really literally no piece of writing that the words shit and fuck don't make better. You know, like, <laughs> I can look, I can work for ages on a paragraph and think it's dull. And if I add shit or poop or calm, it's better. And um, I guess that I should mention, well, we're doing that because we're, we're getting on in time, but I want to show you something else that you sent me. So oh. it's okay. a, a piece of fake poo that you had made in the letter D. <laughs> yes. I can't believe, so I didn't make that myself, right? I had someone- Who had a poo expert make that? A fake pooer make that? You farmed that out. Yes. I mean, now that I'm looking, because I don't think I ever, I just had that sent directly to you, right? So I never have seen yeah. that in person. Now yeah. that I'm looking at it, I, I'm like, I can't believe I just didn't make that myself. Um, Mel? No. And what do you think the material is? Oh, dude, <laughs> I'm not an artist. I don't know what the fake pooers use. But I didn't realize uh, uh, there's a chat, you write in your book about the poo necklace. Yeah, Judy, so Judy Blaine. Um, do you have well, a picture of that? I wish I could see what that. I have a very grainy picture of yeah. it. Um, he, he bought a series of fake turds um, and then put them on a chain and they were they sort of became a bib necklace. A bib because they were, they were like human sized turds. They were human sized and also the gr one of the great things about them, which I mentioned the piece is that they were all different color. They're all different texture. I mean, we all like our poo is never the same two days in a row and nor was his, his necklace was like a testament <laughs> to the variety of shit. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I feel it's apropos because we do talk about shit. I mean, I talk about shit a lot. Yeah. Um, I think we both talk about shit a lot. I'm basically at this point just a vessel for shit to move through. I'm, you know, but isn't every, but isn't I'm just a medium. <laughs> but isn't everyone, Derek? <laughs> well, you know, I keep having, I keep. I keep pushing new frontiers of pooing. Like when I think that there's nothing could be more degrading and awful than what I've been through, I find some way uh, that it becomes awful. Um, God told me this story recently about, uh, I don't know if it was a relative of his or a neighbor and she would, you know, she, she was Italian American and cooked and cooked and cooked and cooked for these big meals. And one time she was hurt uh, complaining all that work for two holes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the spirit. That's not the spirit. <laughs> Which I think is great. Um, 
I guess I don't write, I don't know if I write in the book about a ton of shit, but I, I do have like marvelous experiences with shit. And uh, um, there's an essay in the book about Halloween and lawn inflatables. And I, I like, I'll never forget when I first got cancer and I had to keep going for colonoscopies and they, you know, before they would do it, they would um, pump my ass full of air. And the first time they did, I mean, it was so weird feeling anything going in my ass let's be honest <laughs> but uh I remember they didn't warn me and I took the subway home and about <laughs> halfway between museum and college all the air came out and everything all the people left the bus I could take it and my pants were <laughs> I mean the air dissipated but the rest of the stuff soaked my pants and um I remember thinking I mean, I thought a lot. I thought a lot about that day. I still think a lot about that day. <laughs> and that was a, that's a, actually a really great chapter. Um, thank you. There, there are some really great lines in there. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah. So then I ended up writing about how. I mean, I love the history of Halloween, and the one new thing in Halloween are these yard inflatables, which are yeah. so ubiquitous now, but were non-existent before yeah. Yeah. 2000. And. Um, Yes, yeah, so I write about myself as an inflatable. Um, There's something, but you call it something else too. I'm, I'm going to like not get this right. If I can find it, I'm not going to find it right now. Anyway, it's really good. It's really good. The, what's the, there's something you say about the reverse inflate, the, there's a word, not deinflation, but. Oh, insufflation or something. Insufflation. Like yeah. <laughs> insufflation. Is that a real word? No. I think so. I no, think it, it, it might be a medical word. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I don't think I'm crazy enough to make up a word. I think I must have read that. I might be misusing it, but yeah. that's. I think that's the thread that goes through the book is my misuse of facts <laughs> and history and my own experience. Um, but Okay, so maybe my last question I'm going to pose to you is why do we talk about shit so much? I don't know. And I was, I mean, my question to you is, you know, so much of this stuff that we were going to talk about the show and tell, I would describe as crap. Yeah. And I wonder what the difference between crap and shit is. Nothing. I don't think <laughs> I think turd, crap, shit. I mean, all those words uh, are jewels. Um, but Okay, so I'm just gonna pose you like a heady question. So talk about shit in relation to your work. Is your work, <laughs> is your work shit? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think there's a difference between something being shit and being shitty. Right. Shit I don't think it's shitty. Shit is sort of miraculous and sexy. <laughs> Well, miraculous. I'll I'll stay, I'll go with miraculous and delicious. <laughs> <laughs> you see, now this is. You, didn't hey, you say when you're looking for the ending, you've gone too far? <laughs> this is this is where we're at. I was going to oh, say we should have stopped. <laughs> but that's interesting. Is the ending when you've gone too far? Yes. Do you end when you've gone too far? No, we've gone too far. The ending is. Is, be, is before this. It's about 45 minutes before yeah. that. <laughs> Which is basically all our conversations, right? They always are like, <laughs> we should have- How long have we been talking? A long, a long time. I have to go to, I have to take an Ambien. <laughs> I have to go to bed. It's bedtime. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you reading the book and getting it. Oh, right. it's I mean, so for, great, for this talk. Right? I didn't expect that. It's so great. I didn't expect it either. I didn't realize it was coming. I, I had ordered it so long ago. I didn't know when, you know, I, I asked you the other day when it was published and you were saying it was coming out on the 20th maybe or something. And uh, so I thought I wouldn't get it until then or after that. So it was such a thrill. Well, I'm really it really made me laugh out loud so many times. Like, <gasps> um, that's good. There's a lot of Which you in the that best. book. There's a lot of you in that book uh and so i thank you and thanks for doing this with me 
Yeah, thank you. It's really fun to talk to you as always, as always. We'll talk tomorrow. We'll talk oh, to God. <laughs>